for my grandmother Yuali, who never learned how to write, to my baby brother Maxo Huya, who will read the things that she never wrote. My name is Ngokali Aya, and I'm a writer from the Hmong community, but I'm also discovering that I'm very much a Minnesotan author, and perhaps I'm even, I know I am, an American writer, and I'm contributing to world literature. Before babies are born, they live in the sky where they fly among the clouds. The sky is a happy place, and calling babies down to earth is not an easy thing to do. From the sky, babies can see the course of human lives. This is what the Hmong children of my generation are told by our mothers and fathers, by our grandmothers and grandfathers. They teach us that we have chosen our lives, that the people who we will become, we had inside of us from the beginning, and the people whose worlds we share, whose memories we hold strong inside of us, we have always known. From the sky, I would come again. The book begins in 1975, um, when, the, when the last Air America planes leave the country with the declaration of genocide against the Hmong. Only they, the Hmong didn't know it. And I wasn't born yet, but it is a memoir. And memoirs are not only the memories we hold, but they are the memories passed on to us. And they exist within the frameworks of a bigger world memory. So that's when it begins. Lots of research. Lots of going back to the stories that were told to me, not because I was writing a book, but because everybody wanted to explain why my life was the way it was, why Thanksgiving was Meals on Wheels, and why Christmas was twice her tops. And so I had heard all these stories, and I, it, wouldn't, it would be inaccurate of me to allow the, the story to begin the day I was born. The world that they were living in could no longer hold them safe. It was 1975 and the Vietnam War, as the world knew it, was over. For the Hmong of Laos were those who still lived in the mountains of Sinh Quang. For my mother and father, the American shield had been lifted. The communist government that came to power in May of... The Hmong knew that the Americans had left. One day there were American pilots landing planes on the airstrip, tall men with fair skin walking around the village, laughing and buying local food items, giving candy to the small children. And then one day, the planes flew away into the fog of the clouds, passed over the dark green mountaintops, and did not return. At first, they waited. When the murder started, and the last of the men and the boys began disappearing, the Hmong knew that the only thing coming for them was death. My grandma um, promised me she'd never die, because I was born in a refugee camp, 400 acres, less than a square mile in, in radius, with 40 to 50,000 people. By the time I came along, Grandma was already an old woman with just a single tooth. And she had seen so many grow up and so many change and so many fall down again that she was just happy for this young life to love. Because the Mara knew to what is written, it was with our words that we sought to write and to each other. So I heard so much, so much beautiful language, so many stories. Walking beneath the trees in the compound, my father would say, like the sun is dancing on your skin because it loves you. When the puppies can't open their eyes, he said, it is because your world is so bright. My father used to carry me to the tops of the trees and he'd hold my hand and he'd say, he'd say the size of your hand and your feet will not dictate your life journey. One day your feet will walk on the horizons your father has never seen. And he never lied to me, so I believed him. But we came to America. I was six years old, July 27, 1987. We landed at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, and we drove to the McDonough Housing Project, but we drove through downtown St. Paul. And it was a, a highway of dancing lights to St. Paul, and then lights extending beyond. And I thought, in a world where you can, you, like this, you can follow the lights and you'll never get lost. But I got lost in America. Because we lived in the, in the east side of St. Paul in a 900 square feet home with rotting walls, growing wild with mold. Everybody was always sick. Taylor, my baby sister, had astronomical levels of lead. She couldn't tell the difference between a 3 and S or a 5. And one day I came home and I had never been to a movie theater. So I told my mom and my dad, I, I, I looked at my father in the eye and I told him I hadn't chosen this life that I didn't want it this way that I don't want to belong in a world where a kid has to imagine the insides of a movie theater to be normal. And my father said he would choose me all over again if he could. And that a long time ago, I saw him and my mother walking without shoes, and I chose to come down to them. My father said that life would teach me how strong the human heart is, 
not how weak or how fragile. So I tried again. I tried harder. And I became a, a, a senior at Carleton College, and my grandma said that education was the garden that I cultivated in America and that one day we would reap the harvest together. But she falls down. My senior year, she falls down. And I go to her and I say, get up, Grandma, get up. And she goes, I can't get up. She says, there were people who loved me before you. Long before you, I had a mom and a dad and brothers and sisters. And somewhere in time, they're waiting for me. It would be selfish of you to hold me back. Because when you look at the map, there is no long land. I'm going to climb the mountain of my heart to the house of my youth. And everybody will say, where have you been? We've been so worried. Why are you so late in coming home? I entered Uncle Ang's house and wiped my feet on the rug, looked up and saw my grandmother in a hospital bed beside their east wall. She looked like she was sleeping. I took off my shoes and I approached the bed slowly. Aunt Chu was sitting by the side of the bed on a chair. A few relatives were on the sofa by the window talking quietly. When I saw that Grandma was not sleeping but struggling for breath, her hair matted with sweat, her lips opening and closing in desperation, her one tooth showing, the image became blurry. I got as close as I could to her. I felt the bed rail against my thigh. I put my head on her chest. I said, Grandma, I am here. I said, Grandma, are you okay? I said, Grandma, I love you. I said, Grandma, don't leave me. I said, Grandma, Kalia is here. I said, Grandma, are you okay? I said, Grandma, I am here. I said the same things over and over, and my heart was heavy in my chest, and every breath became harder. I made a lot of noise. She raised a tire hand to my head, and she said, Grandma knows. I said, I love you, Grandma. And she said, don't cry, may I? Grandma knows. She tried to say more things to me, and I tried not to cry, but neither of us could do what we wanted. In all the languages of the earth, in all the richness of words, there is no word, no comparison, no equivalent for my grandmother trying to be strong for me. Her one may I? In moments of danger, long people do one of two things. We flee or we fight. And I, and I, I, and I, it occurred to me, no. There's a moment in between, and sometimes that moment stretches for years. And I understand that all of art speaks to each other, all of literature is in the conversation. And so I wanted to speak to that moment of fleeing and fighting, the moment in between, the moment that lives like mine come from. And, and so it becomes um, a story about a young writer in America on the east side of St. Paul trying to garner a voice in a world where she had gone silent. Because when I was seven, we went to Kmart, and my mom was looking for light bulbs, and she pointed to the ceiling. She says, I'm looking for the thing that makes the world shiny. But she has an accent. So the clerk doesn't really understand. And the clerk walks away. And because Laos was the most heavily bombed nation in the world, and my mom and dad grew up in the most heavily bombed province of Laos, because my father said that when, grown man, when the bombs fell and grown man ran, my mother would walk. I'd always thought she was incredibly brave. But in that Kmart, she didn't know where to look. She, so she looked at her feet. She couldn't look at me. And I decided that if the world didn't need to hear my mother and my father, then surely it didn't need to hear me. So I stopped talking the next day. I've only been speaking for almost two years, the publication of the book, April of 2008. I was a selective mute for most of my life. I never thought that I would um, make my living, because young writers are not paid to write, we're paid to speak. If we're, if we're any good, that I would make my life in words spoken. But I do it. I do it because I know so many people who cannot speak, even when the words are there, like my father, who will not be listened to. So I feel I have a great deal of responsibility and a great deal of work to do. For me, writing is not about the subject, the verb, and the noun. It is a sequencing of meaning, a chase after inspiration, to see whether one word has the power to call in the next. Plus, the work that we do in the moment lives in the moment. No matter what happens tomorrow, the work I do today stands.